All right, time for lecture number two. So I'm not going to go all the way through this lecture because it got quite long, and I'm going to save the impacts and effects of earthquakes for Tuesday. We'll discuss that, and also I'll give you some time on Tuesday to go through any questions you've had from these two lectures. And then Thursday, we'll uh, jump right into tsunamis. And as you'll see it in today's lecture, it's a really natural transition. So the goal of today's uh, lecture is really to have you understand the, the wave dimension of earthquakes as well as how the impacts of earthquakes are affected by local conditions. So those are the big take-home kind of ideas. So before we get into that, let's just review where we got to in the last lecture. So I'm not going to go through magnitude and uh, uh, and impacts. Um, instead, what I'm really interested in with you here remembering is the mechanism behind it. So elastic rebound, this mechanism here. So the basic idea, remember, is that we get two plates which are moving past each other. In this example here, this would be a transform fault where the movement is lateral. And this fault becomes stuck at some point. And so while the rest of the thing continues to move, this portion here cannot move. And so as a result, everything around it starts to deform. So this starts to deform, and it's going to store energy in this area here elastically. And that energy is going to continue storing and storing and storing until eventually the, <coughs> until eventually the energy stored here is sufficient to overcome the frictional resistance along this spot. And this whole portion is suddenly going to jump forwards, returning to its original shape, and it is going to release seismic waves. I guess I'll, maybe I'll do them as waves like this. This is a terrible drawing. But you know what I'm trying to do here. These are waves emanating out from that source. So that's the basic idea. So here you go. There is the, there is the plate sliding past each other with no, uh, no problem. Um, and then they are jumping forwards. So that's the idea. So here you go. There's time number one. Uh, this actually, sorry, this one's supposed to show they're, them actually deforming. They're moving, but here it's supposed to show they're not moving. And this is where that elastic strain is accumulating. And it is storing energy as a result of actually physically deforming the rocks. And then there's a rupture. It jumps forwards. And so a rupture, remember, can happen in one of two ways. Either they just physically slip past each other, so that frictional resistance is overcome, or... Alternatively, it can actually physically break the rock, so it deforms in a brittle manner. It physically breaks, right, creating new faults. Most of the time, what's actually happening is overcoming frictional resistance, although actually these are not mutually exclusive. They, both could be the case. All right, and at that point, we've restarted, and we are at step number one again, and it's going to continue in this pattern of strain accumulation, failure, strain accumulation, failure, strain accumulation, failure, over and over and over with a statistically predictable rate until eventually movement along that fault stops. So the, the source ultimately of the energy, that tectonic motion, which is putting all of the, the strain into this equation, if that motion eventually stops, then the earthquake stops. But otherwise, we're in an earthquake cycle, which is why we can say with confidence, statistical confidence, that Vancouver, for example, will experience a very large earthquake in the future. All right. So here is a term I introduced last time. I'm going to remind you of it. So the term asperity refers to the, the stuck portion of a fault. And this is a, a simplified diagram here, you know, in two dimensions showing a single asperity. But you could have multiple. There could be asperities all along this line. They could be everywhere along here. Right? But that asperity is a portion where no movement is taking place and where deformation occurs around. So that's the actual stuck portion of the plate. And that's where ultimately that seismic energy is being stored around the asperity and it's where the seismic waves are going to emanate from when eventually this portion ruptures. So here's a quick little video just showing. All right, so movement, storage via deformation right here and then rupture. Boom and there come your seismic waves off and everything jumps forwards. So that's the classic kind of depiction of, a, uh, of an earthquake. I'm going to show you the next thing, a really cool little animation. And by the way, go check out this website if you want. IRIS, I forget what the, this is an acronym, I forget what it stands for. Uh, they're a clearinghouse for educational material on, um, on seismic science and seismic hazards, and they put up fantastic stuff. 
So here's another example. This is put up by a professor, but the IRIS organization posted it online. And so this is a, a model using spaghetti, and he'll explain what's going on here. So this is the fault. The fault is right here. Here are the two sides of the fault. Remember, by the way, this would be the hanging wall. This would be the foot wall, right, because you could walk down this. Anyways, in this analogy, strain is, strain is building up, and you're going to watch the strain actually form or, uh, or accumulate within each one of these strands of spaghetti. And a couple of big take-homes. I want you to watch it accumulating, but the second thing I want you to see is that when one of these actually snaps, all of the, all of the energy that it was holding back is going to get transferred to the next, or portion of that, maybe not all, but a portion of the energy is going to get transferred to the next piece of spaghetti. And so what you can frequently have is a series of asperities. Each one of these represents an asperity, each piece of spaghetti, where you'll have rupture at one portion, and like a set of dominoes, by putting a little bit more strain on the next one, or rather, sorry, a little bit more stress on the next one, uh, strain is actually a reference to deformation. Stress is a different one. I've been using strain in the colloquial way, not the technical way, but strain is actually a response. Stress is the, is the force. So it's going to put a little bit more stress on here, which is going to deform this a little bit more until it's going to snap, and it can send a cascading sequence going all the ways down. But it doesn't have to be this one and then this one. It could be this one, this whole rest of the system has a little bit more stress, and that pushes this one over the hedge, which pushes this one, and then that pushes this one, and this thing can eventually cascade. But often you actually get a directional cascading going on, and you're going to see that in this video. All right, enough chatting at you. Let us play this video. This is a model of a strike slip fault. Two pieces of wood, they're sliced all the way through here, and there's grooves going in this direction, perpendicular to the fault zone. This we're going to tighten in this direction here, which will cause motion like this, which is right lateral strike slip motion. And the fault zones don't have uniform friction. Usually there are spots that are stuck patches, which we call asperities. And each noodle in this model represents an asperity. So as I turn the uh, tighten device, you can see the fault is starting to move. But now the noodles, which are acting as asperities, are preventing that motion. I'm going to move very slowly and we'll see what happens in terms of sequence of noodle breakages. Slowly I'm turning crank and now I'm not seeing much motion like, oh there we go. One earthquake went, one small earthquake. Another one, another. I'm turning at a uniform speed. I can feel the stress is building up. So what we had was a sequence of oh, there goes another one, a sequence of events where there were a few at the beginning, and then there were quite a few in the middle that might have represented a little bit larger earthquake or multiple asperities, one breaks after the other, and then right at the end we had another pop or two, which would be aftershocks or equivalent to aftershocks. So I'm actually going to clarify one thing there. I, I referenced the hanging wall and foot wall. Um, that would be true if the little guy was right here and this was the, that was how the fault played out, right? This is a building over here. But he said he's actually modeling that this is a strike slip fault or a transform fault, in which case the little guy is actually, you know, here. I don't know how to draw this in two dimensions in the building, you know, like this, you know. It's not leaning over at its side, but I mean, this is the walking surface here. But if it was the case that this was a fault moving that direction towards the surface here, then this would be the hanging wall and that would be the foot wall. In the case of a uh, perfectly vertical um, strike slip fault, there's not actually any sense to um, a hanging wall and foot wall. All right, so that's a great illustration. He also introduced a couple extra terms in there. The first one is foreshock. Actually, he didn't say foreshock, but those first little little explosions of went off of seismic activity before that big patch there, those could be considered foreshocks. So foreshocks and aftershocks are just uh, seismic activity that takes place either before, in the case of foreshocks, or after, in the case of aftershocks, a main seismic event. And so it's often the case, although not always the case, but often the case that 
Large earthquakes are preceded by slightly smaller activity. Again, that's not always the case. So it is not predictive, but it can be worrying. And then almost always after a large earthquake, that, that continual kind of residual pressure that's built up in the system will be released with a series of uh, moderately smaller um, uh, aftershocks. Okay, so here is a point I want you to consider, which is that remember the lithosphere is the rigid component of the Earth, which sits on top of the asthenosphere. So it's all of the crust and the uppermost mantle. So this is the only portion of the Earth which is actually capable of brittle deformation. And so this is where you're going to be finding earthquakes. You can't make an earthquake down in the asthenosphere because if you push on things, everything's just going to deform. And it's not going to deform elastically and then uh, either return to form releasing energy or eventually overcoming that kind of threshold of elastic energy storage and then faulting brittly. Instead, it's going to reform by elastic, and then if you push it more, it, the whole thing is just going to bend. It would just bend in a completely ductile way, and then you would have uh, no energy release in terms of catastrophic seismic waves. So this is something that could only happen in the lithosphere, but I'm going to show you a kind of a caveat for that in a second. All right, so here's a bit of terminology that you really need to know. The first thing is the term epicenter. The epicenter is the spot directly above. You draw a straight line up from the point of rupture. That is the point where the fault originally fails or releases seismic energy. So that's going to be some spot underground. If you were to draw a line directly up onto the surface, so something you could actually map on the surface, right? So here are the seismic waves that are emanating. I mean, they'd be emanating in every direction in 360 degrees. That's important to remember. That spot that you can draw actually on the map directly above Right, directly apart, the shortest line you could draw, right, that is the epicenter. So that's what you see mapped, and that's what people talk about. But this is where the seismic energy is actually emanating from. And if you'll see in a second, that distance is actually going to determine to some degree right, how powerful the surface is going to feel these seismic waves. So the epicenter, that's the mappable portion, right, directly above, directly above the focus, which is the point of actual failure. Okay, next up, those are just circles showing you that. So next up, here is a map similar to one I've shown you already. These are all of the magnitude five plus earthquakes in the last, I actually don't remember how long this is showing. Uh, I'm gonna show you a different map, and this is something really exciting. One of the reasons I love to go to conferences is to get introduced both to new science, and I'm gonna be talking about some new science as we go on, but also new teaching tools. So I'm gonna just jump out of this presentation for a second, and I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna show you something else here. Uh, let's see, in show, all right. I'm gonna show you a really cool teaching tool that I discovered, I'm gonna be playing around with this a little bit. This is from an organization called the Concord Symposium, uh, which is a, um, in, uh, sorry, Concord Consortium, not Symposium, which is a uh, organization that produces teaching materials. They're publicly funded. So this is super neat. So here is a map, and you can flip around if you want. You can put on a relief map, or you can put on, I'm going to just go for satellite mode here. But you can choose the data you want. So if you want to put on, for example, all the plate boundaries, Boom, there's your plate boundaries. And the, the particular type of plate boundaries are shown there. If I want to know what is the name of the plates, there's your names. You can even look, let's take a look at plate motion. So here you go. Here's the motion that all of these plates are going. I think you even get click here and get, so yeah, so there's the actual velocity. So this is really fast, actually, reasonably fast. It's 144 millimeters a year. So remember, that's about uh, 14 centimeters, or very roughly something like seven inches. That's not quite right, but that's approximately right. And then you can look over here. Let's look at that transform, that strike slip fault. This is the San Andreas. And this one's going at about a third the speed over here. Let's look at the spreading ridge. Right? Let's actually jump up here and look at the spreading ridge right in the middle of the Atlantic. That's 22 millimeters a year. And so you can see that that first one I clicked at is going at lightning speed relative to other tectonic areas. So let's get rid of this guy, and I'm going to turn off these plate boundaries and the plate names. So here is plate boundaries. I can put them on there, but I could also just put earthquakes on. And I'm going to put all of the earthquakes that have occurred in the last um, in the last 30 years, roughly 30 years. Uh, actually, man, we're in the future now, roughly 40 years. So I can just put an animation. You can see them appearing over time. So here they all are showing up. This is real data from the USGS, the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. Uh, 
this is actually starting at 5.1. It's saying down here. I don't know why it has zero. Let's just jump this up and see. Yeah, see, that's not changing anything at all. It doesn't really even need to have a zero there. So these are all of the earthquakes. And you should be able to immediately see that some of them are, some areas have a lot more earthquake than others. The other thing you should see is that if you look at the spreading ridges, they have a lot less than the subduction zones. Now let's turn it up and get it up to kind of a city destroying. This is not a city destroying, but this is, by the time you get up to seven, you are at a seriously large earthquake. So anything, you know, kind of six and a half and above can cause serious damage. But we get up to seven. These are large magnitude earthquakes. First thing you can look at is if we jump along, say, just turn this guy up over here. Uh, can I move this along? I can. Let's move him over here. And I'm just going to go and show you all the ones that have taken place in the last 10 years. You should see that first there are almost none of these earthquakes that are occurring in, in uh, outside of subduction zones or outside rather of convergent boundaries. The other thing you should see is some areas are a lot more prone than others. And this is telling you something about the, the tectonic activity in those areas as well as obviously plate type. Now what if I jump it up and let's say, let's go to 10, right? Let's go to 10. What? None. There has never been an earthquake observed at 10. The largest one is about nine and a half. So I can jump over here and let's just go to nine just to show you how infrequent really large earthquakes are. So there's an eight and a half. Eight and a half is good enough. So this is, let's actually jump back all the ways here to 1980. So it makes no difference, right? These are all of those large earthquakes in 1980. So you have none in North America since 1980, which are eight and a half or above. This is the biggest one on record down here. Oh, wait, no, there should be one which is 9.5. I don't know why you're not showing up. Uh, oh, because it's earlier than that. That's why. Uh, all right, uh, this guy over here, this is the one that caused the, uh, the Fukushima disaster. And this was a 9.0. That was by far the largest in recent record. All right, so this is super neat. So you can do a bunch of really fun things here. You can also throw earthquakes or volcanoes on. And you should be able to see that correlation right here between volcanoes and if we drop this guy back again, really large earthquakes. So they tend to correlate really well. And of course, uh, that is because both of these are being triggered by subduction zones. All right, anyway, this is something to play around with. It's really neat. And in fact, if you go over here and you put map type on, you can look at relief. So a relief map is just one that shows you topographic information, you know, how high things are. And at this point, you can see the very clear relationship between mountains and the process of the mountain building. So tectonics are also building mountains, remember, and the production of earthquakes. I mean, it's a, it's a prerequisite, really, of pushing material up that you are going to get large earthquakes. And you can see that really nicely over here. Remember, this is not a subduction zone. That's the Himalayas, this area here. And you can still see all of these large earthquakes but almost no, essentially no volcanic activity. Because remember, this is an area where you are not getting subduction because this is a continent-continent collision. This part here, India, the Indian subcontinent, let me put the plate boundary on there. The Indian subcontinent is just ramming into Asia and causing all of this rippling as you go along there. Anyways, I love this tool. There's an additional feature in this tool I'm not going to show you right now, but I, I'm going to let you guys play with in the future because I want to go over it together in class. And the additional feature is actually the most exciting part of this. So let's get this and let's go back to our lecture here from current slide. All right, so here you go. So see, they are occurring along all of these tectonic boundary types, but as you saw in the last activity, they are the biggest ones are occurring at subduction zones. And these are sometimes referred to as mega thrust earthquakes. So when you click on the, these links in the PDF version of this, you can see this is actually a, a Canadian hazard page. So specifically talking to earthquakes, this is National Resources uh, Canada, and that's their page here about really large earthquakes, the kinds of things that we might see in Victoria, Vancouver, off the Pacific coast. Here's a map again. This is really fun. This is just kind of a night vision one. Exactly the same thing you saw, but these ones, the color of the, the dots, the brightness of the dots is showing you the magnitude of the earthquakes. And the same kind of information. So really big earthquakes occur uh, along subduction zones. And the reason for that is that, remember, the, the, uh, the magnitude of an earthquake is going to be relative to three different factors. One is the area of slippage, the total area that moves. Two is far how far it moves. And three is the properties of the rocks, in particular if they're very brittle rocks. And all of those criteria are going to be realized quite nicely, are going to be realized quite nicely in a subduction zone like this. So 
Here is, uh, you've got a large area of contact, right? Because you've got this whole thing sliding underneath, right? Uh, these are long linear features. I mean, all these faults are, but you've got a long area of contact. And this is also, these are brittle rocks. They're up near the surface. The further down you go, remember the, uh, the hotter and softer the rocks become. So nice brittle rocks, huge area of contact where you are building up strain and therefore a lot of potential to release that strain after the fact. So here is a uh, here is a cartoon sketch of that. So remember, it's also pulling down. This is a feature we talked before. So this is an oceanic trench along the edge. And this is going to be relevant, actually, this week when we talk about uh, tsunamis. This is going to be directly relevant. But here is your subduction zone. The week after next, we're going to talk about this part of this whole story, is the generating a melt over here. But right now, we're just interested in these really big earthquakes occurring along the edges of these things. So I'm not going to click this uh, this link. Uh, if you, this is just talking about how we use seismic waves to do what we call seismic tomography. This is the scanning of the inside of the Earth, figuring out all these features. You know how there is a uh, outer and inner core, all that kind of stuff using seismic waves. We talked about it in class, but if you click, if you forget how this works, type in that link on your uh, on your page, and you can watch a quick, really good video on this. So this is a map using seismic tomography to demonstrate a bunch of really neat things. And this, this sort of information was actually part of the, the whole buildup of the uh, plate tectonic revolution. You know, all the data that was being gathered to kind of convince scientists this stuff was real. And so in this, in this diagram you see here, it is color-coded based on seismic velocity. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in terms of relevant to, to, to earthquakes. But remember, we already talked about this, that seismic waves pass through material at different rates depending on the density and the temperature of that material. And so what you can see in this image right here, these guys here are going really slow. In this area here, it's going really fast. And so this was, this was, uh, this was identified independently by two different a uh, seismologist, a guy named Benioff, another guy named uh, Wadati. And this is a Japanese scientist, and this was a uh, scientist at California. So once again, really a lot of the early seismo seismological stuff, and still a lot of the most important stuff, for obvious reasons, comes out of Japan and California. Because they're both highly populated uh, areas that experience a lot of, experience a lot of seismic uh, activity. So here is, uh, here is, here is um, seismic wave anomalies. So at this point, it's going really fast through this area. These portions here, it's going slow. Well, why would it be doing that? Well, seismic wave velocity is directly relevant, relative to um, density, which is going to be relative to temperature. And so what you're actually seeing here is a zone which is cold and zones which are very hot. And that hot part... Right? This is these anomalously hot parts. Notice these guys here. Those are volcanic islands. Notice that these anomalously hot parts are sitting directly below volcanoes. So these are actually magma chambers, material moving up. And we're going to deconstruct this portion of it uh, next week. But right now, this is direct evidence for subduction. The fact that you have this cold, angular zone going down with earthquakes, all these dots of earthquakes all along it. So how would that be the case? Well, that's explained quite nicely by the fact that this is cold lithosphere being forced down uh, into the underlying asthenosphere. Now, this part here, we're going to unpack a little bit later on because this is weird, right? Why do you have all of these earthquakes going on at this crazy depth? That's about the maximum depth that you get any kind of earthquakes at all. And this is a depth you actually should not be able to get earthquakes. And it's super controversial. So up here... Remember, this is sliding by all of this material right here, right? It's sliding by, so as it slides by the lithosphere, the lithosphere in an ocean thing is really shallow, and this is underlying a stenosphere. That frictional interaction, this area locks up, and it generates earthquakes. So you should only be able to actually lock that up frictionally in just the uppermost kind of bit here. Down here, this material should be so deformable that you should not be able to actually build any kind of information up here uh, as a result of frictional interaction. So what's going on? It's actually super controversial, and um, seismologists don't agree. But the idea, some of the ideas anyways, represent that as this bottom part of the plate starts to heat up, 
uh, it undergoes different kinds of transformations in terms of mineralogy. And one of the things it might be doing is actually losing water. And that losing water component is really important for generating this stuff up here. And we'll talk about that again next week. But if it does that, that could actually make this material more brittle. And what you might be seeing, remember the slab pull idea that this is being pulled on? You might actually see extension going on here. As this pulls, you may actually see this thing breaking in a brittle way internally down at this bottom. There are other ideas that have to do with mineralogical transformation so that uh, there is a major uh, um, state change between one mineral kind and another mineral kind as this heats up and that causes the solar area to implode. A number of different models, but we're going to kind of go off the idea here that what's going on is some kind of dewatering which is making this material more brittle and it actually just fails as a result of it being pulled on. That's certainly one working hypothesis, although not everyone is convinced on that kind of stuff yet. All right, so there is that. Okay, so back to this idea that we're looking at different kinds of waves. So remember, our waves are generated at some spot, the focus. They are then going to propagate out from that spot, and they are going to propagate out in every single direction. If you're wondering why my voice is slowing down, it's because I am wandering now, holding my laptop and getting my charger. Uh, let me see actually if I can pause this for a second. I can't. So you're just going to have to stare at this diagram while I plug in my charger, otherwise we're going to lose our power here. All right, we are back and good to go. So let's think about what happens after this stuff propagates out from that locality. So it's going to spread out in every kind of area. So those waves are obviously what we're concerned about in terms of damage. They're also how we generate all of this information. So how do we know where an earthquake occurred underground? How do we know where it first manifests that epicenter? It turns out it's all about waves. So ordinarily in class, I would do a dance. If you're lucky on Tuesday, I might. But we're going to move through this uh, right now just with this PowerPoint. So first I'm going to subdivide into two categories, a body wave and a surface wave. As you might guess, a surface wave, these things are restricted to surface movement. Body waves can transfer through the center of the Earth itself. So we already looked at S waves and P waves. P waves are primary waves. These are the fastest ones. These are not just equivalent to, they actually are just sound waves. It's the same idea. One one uh, one uh, atom bumps into another, pushes it forward, bumps into another, pushes it forwards, etc. Exactly like billiard balls hitting each other. So body waves, body waves and surface waves, in addition to the fact that they transfer through different materials, have very different destructive potential and travel at very different speeds. In fact, even even the body waves themselves transit at different speeds, and that's going to be super duper important. So surface waves, really bad in terms of actual destruction. Bear that in mind. Okay, so here are the main wave types. The first ones are these P waves. And these things are just moving by one atom, hitting another, hitting another, moving around like this. So the analogy uh, is if you get a slinky and you whack one end of the slinky and the seismic waves go straight through it. So these are primary waves, just called P waves, or you can think about them as P rational waves because they're the result of compression. And so here is a little animation showing one of these things cruising along. There's your P wave, your compression wave. These are by far the fastest ones, and they really aren't scary. You're going to feel a little rumble, and at that point, you're going to start waiting for the big scary things to come along. So the next ones to arrive are S waves. Remember, these ones cannot go through liquids. This was the argument in favor, remember, of the outer core being liquid. One of the first things we used was that S wave shadow where they don't arrive. And so these things are kind of a snake-like. They, they move in a undulating motion through materials. They are the second ones to arrive, so they are secondary. And you can think about it as S-like, maybe, in terms of the shape, or moving like a snake, maybe, if you want. So here's an animation of these things moving along. So these are the second waves that are going to arrive. And these, again, are both capable of moving through the body, the, the interior of the Earth itself. Now, after these things arrive, there's a whole series of surface waves that arrive. And I'm going to show you two of them. Those two are not exhaustive. I'm just giving you two to show you how complex these seismic waves can be and also to just introduce you to the class of, uh, of surface waves. So here is an L wave. So an L wave kind of moves in a side-by-side -side motion that's horizontal. 
And this is the kind of stuff, think about if you're a house and you are on the ground and the ground is literally moving side to side like that, that's going to rip apart your foundations. And so here is your L wave moving along like that. And then here is a Raleigh wave. And this is a weird kind of backwards rolling motion that goes along. And this is also one of these really destructive waves. So Raleigh and love waves. These are both named after scientists, by the way. Um, physicists, I believe. So here is the Raleigh wave being kind of modeled. And notice it's got this actually a, a backward motion as it moves along like this. All right, so it's moving along like that. It's a weird backward motion. Here it comes. There's a Raleigh wave. So these are two examples of surface waves. Again, there are tons of these. These are the slowest by far and also the most destructive. Okay, so let's talk about that speed component because that is where we get the locality data from. And it actually is super easy to understand. Now, as a heads up, there will be a question on the midterm and on the final exam, which says something like explain how uh, we use the relative velocities of uh, seismic waves to, uh, uh, to determine the focus and epicenter of an earthquake. So be prepared for that. Well, I'll say with 95% confidence that question will be on there. It'll be on there in some form, but it will almost certainly be on there in exactly that wording or very close to it. Okay, so there is your seismograph. When you look at a seismograph, it's going to look like this. So this is from time zero. So the clock starts running at this point. And these little wiggle waves come along first. So after, say, one minute, you go, these little guys come along. Shortly thereafter, these bigger ones come along. And then after a little bit longer, these big surface waves start coming along. Remember, these are the destructive ones. So there's this time gap in terms of how long it comes along. But these two are what I want you to be interested in or pay attention to, the P waves and the S waves. That gap is how we locate the epicenter and focus of an earthquake. Now that gap is going to not be constant, but it is going to be constant relative to distance traveled. Because P waves and S waves, they have, a, uh, they have a constant velocities through different kinds of materials. And therefore, the longer right, they are traveling, the further they have traveled, or rather, the further they have traveled, the greater the gap is going to be between. So we are using that lag. So if the earthquake had happened right next to us, the P waves would arrive first, but the S waves would arrive almost immediately afterwards. But because these things are always faster than these things, the further they travel, the further ahead these get. Now imagine that you were, just imagine you were having a sprint or you're having a race with an Olympic athlete. So if you guys, the Olympic athlete is always going to beat you, obviously, unless some of you are, are closet Olympians. If you are, congratulations. Uh, the... If you imagine you're getting ready and you're about to have a run, in fact, imagine the whole class, well, I don't know, let's imagine the two of you, you're racing. So if you start off right, and you set at, you go at given velocities, constant velocities, if you only race for five seconds, let's say you do a, you do a, a not even five seconds, let's say you just say you, you run 50 meters. If you run 50 meters, the Olympian is obviously beating you, but he's going to beat you by, I don't know. I don't know how fast people run in races. Let's say uh, that Olympian is running 50 meters. He's running just a few seconds. You're going to run it a lot slower. So maybe you are three or four seconds behind him when you, by the time you arrive. If it's 100 meters, he's probably going to beat you by, you know, seven seconds. If it's a 200 meters, maybe he's going to beat you by 20 seconds. If it's a kilometer, maybe he'll beat you by a minute. I mean, I'm making these numbers up. But the longer you have been racing, right, the greater the distance the racing, that longer the lag is between when the Olympian arrives and when you arrive. So this is the Olympian right here, this P wave, this is the Olympian, and this is you here. The longer these guys race, the further distance, the further ahead this is going to be. And that's what we do for locality. That's it. So from this, from that arrival time, that distance and arrival time, we can tell exactly the distance. So in this case, if there was a 50 second difference in arrival time, that means that the earthquake had to have occurred 420 kilometers away. Because the amount of time, right, the amount of time it takes, right, or the the distance, the to the distance. Ah, I'm not explaining this well. Because these things have given velocities and constant velocities, to have a 50 second difference, they will have had to have traveled for 420 kilometers. If they've been traveling for say 500 kilometers, they would come in maybe at 
you know, 58 seconds difference, etc. So that gives us distance traveled, but it does not give us locality, right? It does not give us that epicenter or that focus information. So how we are going to figure that out is not with one, which is simply giving us distance traveled, any one of these guys here. These are three different seismic stations located at different distances from wherever that epicenter or focus was. So each one of these is only giving you distance traveled, but together, collectively, they are going to give you that locality information. And this is how this is going to work. So imagine that you have an earthquake and it, that earthquake, here is your seismic station. Your seismic station is right in the middle right here. This is seismic station number one, right? And so it has taken some amount of time to get here. And let's say that that distance is, I don't know, let's say that's that 420. So that's 420. So if it is 400, if it has traveled 420 kilometers, remember it's going to be 50 seconds. So there's a 50 second lag time when this guy hears it, station one, there's a 50 second lag time by the time they arrive between the P waves and S waves. So that's telling you it's gone 420 kilometers, but it doesn't tell you what direction. It could have come from that spot right there and gone 420 kilometers. It could have come from this spot right here and gone 420 kilometers. It could have come from this spot right here or really any of these. So all that tells you is it came from somewhere in that circle. It could have come from any of those spots. Now imagine I have it another one, right? Same situation, apologize my circle here. Same situation, I don't know what the number would be here, right? But here I know it's come this distance or it's come, you know, this distance. Again, it could have come from anywhere on the outside. The lag time in this case is greater. All this guy knows, this is Seismic Station 2, all he knows is that uh, it has come from somewhere along the circumference of this circle. That circle is just defined, those are all, every spot along here is a possible origin of that earthquake. And now imagine you've got another one, and this one here is way bigger, and it, it looks like this. This is huge, this is somewhere, this is on the other side of the world. That seismic station is here, and it's seismic station number three. And all it knows is that it's somewhere along this line, and that line obviously continues outside. So each one of these seismic stations only has distance data. But you see that point where they all converge together right there? That point where they converge together is going to be the epicenter. And that's all we do. So we call this triangulation. So tri, remember, is the word for three. So we're going to triangulate, right? We're going to have three or more seismic stations, and they're going to tell us, they're going to tell us where that epicenter is. Now to discover the focus, it's exactly the same idea, just a little bit more complicated math, because now we're working in three dimensions, remember, because we're trying to get, you know, the focus, let's say that's a subduction zone, those are mountains, we're trying to get the fact that that earthquake originated here, right, somewhere underground, so we need three-dimensional information, the epicenter would just be that spot on the surface up here, if this is the, let's say that's the surface, the little guys can walk here. That's a bad drawing, but imagine that's not a line inside the mountain, but this is a series of mountains. Here's the mountains. Those are mountains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that spot on the surface might be the epicenter. Okay, so here is real numbers. This is the same thing I'm trying to draw here. Those are the numbers in the previous slide. So going back here, if there is a three-minute lag between P and S wave arrival times, then you know it has gone 1,800 kilometers. But it could have come any point along here. If there is a 35 uh, minute lag, it's gone 3,300 kilometers. That's this green circle. So here's the station. That station knows it's come from somewhere along here. These three stations, one, two, and three, they all take their distance data, plot it out to get one of these circles, and the overlap between those three circles, that's going to be the epicenter. A little bit more complicated math, and it's going to give you the focus down below. So if you can emulate that on an exam, just explain triangulation, right? explain that relationship between P and S waves, the further the distance traveled, the greater the lag time, and therefore you can get, by lag time, you can get distance traveled. You can use that to define a circle of possible, uh, of possible origins, three circles, the overlap between them equals your epicenter. Okay, so let's talk about those waves and what they're doing in addition to just providing data on locality. Obviously they are shaking, which is why we are concerned about earthquakes. So let's look at how shaking is affected, because that, as a human being, is what you are really concerned about. So you have some energy which is produced, right? and that energy could be, let's say in this case, there's a 6.7, there is a 6.8. Both of these 
had functionally the same amount of energy released. You know, this is whatever, uh, slightly more, 1.3 times, something like that, uh, more shaking. But it's, it really is not very much larger in the scheme of possible sizes of earthquakes, which can be hundreds of thousands of times larger than others, remember. But what I want you to notice, this is our severity scale. This is the modified Mercalli intensity scale. Remember, this is measuring actual shaking damage, damage. And notice that the shaking damage is greater in this one here, which is smaller in magnitude than this one here. So how can this smaller earthquake have caused more damage than this one right here? How can this smaller earthquake have caused more surface shaking than this larger earthquake over here? I mean, they're almost the same size, but this one is, you know, reasonably larger. So how is that possible? Well, that's because it's not just about the size of the earthquake. It's about a number of other things about where the earthquake occurred and which area is being affected. So let's unpack it in the simplest part to start with. So the first idea is magnitude. Then we've got position relative to the fault rupture, directionality of rupture, and that's also kind of, these are kind of interrelated ideas. And finally, local geologic conditions. This has nothing to do with anything. I put that in there uh, when I made this original PowerPoint slide in the States, and I think it was... Uh, Oh, shaking. That's what this is. This is supposed to be shaking. That's hilarious. Okay, there we go. Makes sense to me now. Okay. Remember, though, that if you, this is the relative amount of shaking is going to be affected by this, but the same amount of shaking can cause two different buildings to fall down in two different areas, can cause more people to die depending on population density. So all those factors in the beginning. So at this point, we're just talking kind of about hazard. We're talking about the actual physical processes itself, right? The shaking. But then what happens afterwards, remember, is all that human dimension. Well, let's talk about the shaking part of it. Okay, here is this diagram here, right? This is relative energy released based on magnitude of earthquake. So everything else being equal, all other things being equal, if nothing else changes, identical localities, identical distance, everything else, obviously a bigger original earthquake is gonna cause more damage because a bigger earthquake releases more energy and causes more surface shaking. Simple. All right, so here is uh, another diagram, and this is taking this information and adding distance to it. So here is the, uh, the time until things arrived. That was the first idea we had, remember, about locality. So here's your little P waves, they come along, and then your S waves and all that other stuff comes along. Right? It took seven seconds in Pasadena. There's the epicenter. There's Pasadena, right? seven seconds until this stuff arrived. And look at how intense the shaking was in Pasadena. On the other hand, if you go all the way to Needles, which is way over here, it took 65 seconds for those waves to hit. But notice how small, right? Remember, this is, this is, a, this is a seismogram. So these are the actual, just a, a pen representation of the magnitude of that shaking of the waves. So why is this one so much less you know, shaky than this big one up here? Well, for exactly the same reason in that if I was walking away from this microphone, the further I get away from the microphone, the quieter my voice is going to sound. Energy attenuates with distance. That's why when a, uh, you know, if, you're, if your neighbor three houses down is having a party, you're sleeping through fine. If your housemate is blaring the music or your next door neighbor is having a party, you're not sleeping. Exactly the same volume of music is going to sound a lot louder, closer than far away. That's a pretty simple idea, right? And you know that intuitively. You've experienced that. Maybe, hopefully not, but maybe banging on a wall, telling your neighbors to shut up, right? Because they're right next to you. Don't you know I live right next and I'm trying to sleep? Same idea. So here is the next door neighbor, right? Here's the next door neighbor. Here's the guy having the party. If you're three houses down, the actual energy that gets to you, the volume in the case of, uh, in the case of music, but the shaking in the case of uh, earthquakes is going to be less the further you are away. So that's the first idea. And this is just referred to as attenuation. That's just a loss of energy with distance. That's all attenuation means. So these seismic waves, all of them are going to lose energy over distance. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. And then we can go back to those two earthquakes we saw before. And here is your 6.8. Here's your 6.7, the Northridge earthquake. Remember that the 6.7 caused more damage on the surface. The shaking was more intense. Well, why was that? That's because the focus was only 19 kilometers underground here. And so it lost energy as it traveled to the surface. They both did, 
But this one had to travel 52 kilometers from the focus to the epicenter. And so it had to travel you know, almost three times as far. And so it's going to have attenuated a lot more. So even though this was a slightly larger earthquake to start, it had lost so much energy by the time it got to the surface that it couldn't cause as much damage. And here it is just showing you again with your intensity scale. Cool. And there it is, back to the slide. Now here is a, uh, a, a different diagram and notice that what you've got going, this is Los Angeles, this is a big earthquake in Los Angeles, uh, just outside of Los Angeles, and notice that you've got a series of really counterintuitive things. So here's the epicenter. What you would expect is to see a bullseye pattern of damage moving away from the epicenter. So right next to the epicenter, greater damage, right? Lesser, lesser, lesser. And it should be equal in every direction. That's what you'd expect from this really simplified model over here. But you can see that even if you look here, you've got little pockets of more intense damage here than you do right next to the epicenter. So you can see that in the real world, that's not the case. Now notice the most intense damage was actually over here. This is where the most intense shaking was. So why would that be the case? Why do things get stronger as you move away from the epicenter rather than weaker here and way stronger as you moved all the ways over there? So in a, a kind of a diagonal line, right, as you moved away, you got way more damage going on. What, what is happening there? What's happening there? This is the result of the fact that you are not just having a single point. The focus is, remember, where rupture begins. But rupture doesn't stop there. Rupture can continue along, just like with our spaghetti example, where one little bit of asperity sets off another, sets off another, sets off another. That entire fault can rupture in a sequence all along. And in fact, literally thousands of kilometers of fault plane can all rupture in one seismic event, which is why the shaking can last for you know minutes sometimes. Because large areas, large areas are consecutively, large areas are consecutively rupturing. Okay, so depending on the directionality of that rupture, depending on the directionality of that rupture, you're going to have greater damage potentially. So why does that make sense? Well, if you imagine that the rupture just continued happening in one spot, so you had an earthquake here, another earthquake here, another earthquake here, or just a single earthquake, a single earthquake, the waves are going to propagate out from there. If this keeps going, if I just had multiple earthquakes in one spot, you are going to get a series of little pings like this. Ping, 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 ping. And it's going to be equal in damage. And predictably, the damage is going to be less as you get further away. But remember that the fault can start rupturing at that spot, but then the fault can continue rupturing along. So it, the first initial rupture is here, then it ruptures here, then it ruptures here, then it ruptures here, which means at this point, at this point sometime in the future, just after this one, uh, waves are going to be being emanated from that spot. So this whole circular emanation is moving along. And so here is a diagram showing how that can happen. Now, the closer together those waves, the more concentrated the energy is going to be when it hits you. So you can see that if you are right here, if you are on the direction of the fault rupture, if you're in this side as opposed to this side, you're getting hit with the same amount of energy, by the way, in both directions, you know, ultimately. But here it's more concentrated together. Actually, no, that's not true. There's some attenuation over here. Okay, so here is where this can get really bad. If the rate of fault rupture, if the fault rupture is first directional, but also the rate of fault rupture is actually faster, is actually faster than the, uh, the rate at which the seismic waves are traveling. So the rupture itself is taking place at supersonic speeds. That means you can have an instance where the fault is literally rupturing at the point where all of the previous waves from the previous ruptures along that fault have already arrived at. In which case you get this simultaneous buildup right, of waves and you get hit with what's called a mock front. The same thing is true with an airplane. We have an airplane going at supersonic speeds. Eventually all those sound waves are kind of accumulated together and you get hit with all of this, this mock front of all of that, that, that sound energy hitting you simultaneously with that big sonic boom. So here is an idea of a mock front moving along. This is the scary part, right? You see how this is all accumulating right here. So this is called super shear. Super shear is when the rupture is faster than the actual rate at which those waves are traveling. And so you're going to hit by this mass of overlapping seismic energy. Right? And these are super duper dangerous. Okay, 
So there's an example of how uh, location relative to fault can have an effect. So the further away from the point of rupture you are, the uh, less you're going to feel the earthquake. Right? Unless, add on to that, you are in, it's a directional rupture and you are in the direction of the rupture, in which case you're going to get hit potentially by accumulated seismic energy along that rupture plane. Now let's talk about the actual rock type itself. So if you were hitting, on a, you, were, you were in two different spots, both of which are actually receiving exactly the same amount of seismic energy. If you are sitting, you're standing on top of one rock type versus another, you are going to experience that seismic energy differently. And the reason for that is that soft material is going to slow that material, that soft material, geologic material I'm talking about here. So I'm talking about, say, uh, you know, gravel versus solid basalt rock. This is going to slow it down and it's going to cause those waves to build up and amplify. Now this isn't a related idea that we're going to unpack in a second. And this is just the idea that, that the waves are bouncing around in a room potentially with the walls of the room being different types of geologic structures. And so those sound waves as they bounce around can accumulate, can accumulate in certain areas. So here is a map of uh, earthquakes of various magnitudes in Canada. Remember, these are where the big megathrust earthquakes are. This is the scary spot over here. This part we're going to unpack later on. This is another area that you can have potentially earthquakes over here, including very rarely noticed in Nova Scotia. This area, they tend to be way, way smaller, but you can get hurt by them at a greater distance. And the reason for that is that this is all soft recent sediment. A lot of this is the Fraser River depositing materials over here. Right? So the Fraser River is a big drainage system. It deposits rest stuff. We're talking about flooding. When we talk about flooding, we'll revisit this. So you've got soft sediments all built up down here. And when this, these earthquakes, when they propagate through that, they're going to go really slow, but the waves are going to get really big. These are big seismic waves. Over here, they're not going to get slowed down. So they're going to be these small waves that go a really long distance. And so you get, can get hurt, ironically, at a larger distance here. But here, you're going to feel the effects a lot more. Plus, the original energy is actually a lot larger over here, too. So there's young, complex, soft versus old, simple, and dense. So any area where you have reasonably young, and why do I say young? Well, because remember, exactly the same rock if it's an igneous rock, if it is older, it's going to be colder and therefore denser. So here's your cold, dense, old rocks. These are younger volcanic rocks. They're relatively hotter. That's going to have an effect. You also have all these sediments and things over here, which are soft over here. This is relatively simple geology. It's a lot of limestones, a lot of basement rock, we call it. So uh, uh, metamorphic rocks and granites, things like that over here. The other thing is that you have a lot of different complex geology. When you go through here, you go through a lot of different kinds of geology. You're going to get slowed down at each one of those points. So here is a uh, just a quick cartoon. So this is relative speed with the uh, amplification on top of it. So they're going to go really fast through this material. Through sedimentary rock, as opposed to hard igneous rock, it's going to slow down, and that energy is going to start translating into higher and more powerful waves. Alluvium is a fancy way for just saying gravel and sand, unconsolidated materials. So this is a sedimentary rock. This is just sediment. It's going to really slow down. Finer grain sediment, and especially wet finer grain sediment, it's going to really slow down. You get crazy amplification. So wet, unconsolidated is by far your worst. Unconsolidated in general is really bad. The best place to experience an earthquake is a nice hard igneous rock. It's going to just zip straight through that stuff with no amplification, really. This stuff here is really bad. And unfortunately, when we look at Vancouver and most areas of South Central California, we have large amounts of this kind of material, which take the fact that we already have a greater risk of earthquakes and massively amplify them. So here's a quick little diagram just showing if it was really simple geology, right, just all exactly the same geology, and you had an earthquake, that middle point there is showing the kind of epicenter of the earthquake, the waves emanating out from that point. And the height of the column here represents the size of the earthquake. So this is a hypothetical and, and essentially an imaginary environment. And you can click on this link up here or type that link in if you want to see this diagram. So here you go. And it's just going to be like exactly the same as dropping a uh, rock into a calm pond. You're going to see just perfect little circles going out. They're going to get less in magnitude as you move further away. So here is your very simple diagram. Woo!
there's your waves. Ripples in a pond. No problem at all. It's ripples in a pond. Now, here is a more realistic depiction of it. Again, this is a cartoon. I don't think this is a real area. Maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, but uh, this would be moving through different kinds of underlying geology. So some areas have deeper sediment, some areas have softer sediment. There are faults of other different places. There are contrasts between different things that are bouncing things around in different areas. And so this combination of things being slowed and amplified and bouncing around and amplified is going to produce something more like this in reality, where some areas are going to get hit by different amounts. Notice as well that it lasts a lot longer. And that's because some of these waves are bouncing off and returning backwards. And if you've ever dropped a rock in a pond, you've seen this. Or drop a handful of rocks, you've seen this. Right? Waves emanate out from each point, and then they bounce off of waves that have emanated out from another point, and they bounce together, and some areas get higher, some areas are lower, and they're bouncing all around relative to each other, also bouncing off other structures. And so you end up with this really complicated pattern, the combination of the interaction of all these waves, interaction with the substrate. Let me see, it's just frozen up on me there. There we go. So there we go. That is the more realistic depiction. And this is the kind of stuff that earthquake modelers have to actually model. So let's look at in the real environment some examples. This is the San Francisco Bay. If you guys have ever been to San Francisco, you know this is all, you know, multi-million dollar houses all in here. What you may not know is all of this orange stuff is fake. So that was not actually the shoreline. And it's where most of, you know, the, the biggest development occurs because everyone wants to live on the water, right? So this was actually bay fill. They just took garbage and they filled it in. So this is just mud and gravel and stuff. So they built up an artificial extension so they'd have more area to construct. All of this lighter colored stuff, this is older material, which is alluvium. Remember, this is gravel and sand. Only this area here is actual solid rock. This stuff is all soft sediment of various depths. And this is the weakest of all of this. Ironically, that's where most of the people are going to be living. So this is obviously not a good uh, example. This is the 2000 or the, the 1989 uh, earthquake. Remember, we looked at this already. And this was a famous uh, um, well, disaster is not the right term, but a, a tragedy that occurred. This, was a, this, this whole section of highway used to be above, and it completely collapsed on top, crushing all the cars within here. It was an active freeway at the time. And notice where that occurred, right over here in this bright orange area. And that's because this is an area that had amplified shaking. Here is a map, in this case, of LA. And I want you to notice this is the uh, amount of amplification. Some of these areas here are experiencing only a fifth of the amount of shaking as other areas from the same seismic waves going through them. Right? The same seismic waves going through here versus here. This one is going to have six or five times as intense shaking as over here. Because this is the area where those waves are being slowed down and pulled up and amplified. So let's look at that and let's zoom in a little bit more. And what you'll see is that these are areas where you have much softer sediment. But in addition to that, this is not only softer sediment, this is thicker sediment. So this material amplification is going to be a result not only in the type of material, in particular with sediment amplifying things, but also the relative thickness of that sediment. So this is a, uh, a kind of paleogeographic reconstruction. This is all filled in at this point. But this was an old basin. And over millions of years, sediment filled this in. So this whole thing is mostly filled in now. But at this point, the sediment is actually something like, uh, you know, this is over six kilometers deep. And so right in the middle of that, where the sediment is the deepest, is where you're going to get that most intense amplification. This is also sediment over here, but it's nowhere near as thick. So type of sediment, type of material, as well as relative thickness when you're dealing with sediment is super important. Okay, so here is uh, an additional idea. And this is not, at this point, thinking about one material slowing things down. Rather, we're thinking about how hard rock can cause things to bounce off and come back. So think about if you yell in a, in a canyon or a room and you yell, hello, and you hear the echo, hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, echo, 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 echo. Those echoes you hear it coming back at you, and especially if you hear multiple ones, is because those sound waves are bouncing off, coming back at you, but they're bouncing off in different directions, they're emanating from you in every direction, 
They're hitting something and bouncing off in different directions, and so they start bouncing all over the place. Now, if you have ever been to a concert hall, or if you're in music, you really know this. Concert halls, and they try to design this on purpose, but sometimes they're poorly designed. There are some areas in a concert hall where all of those sound waves, which are bouncing around from the band playing, bouncing around, will converge on one spot or cancel each other out in other spots. So some areas of the same concert hall can have amazing acoustics or be way louder than other areas. And you may have experienced this kind of as well if you've ever been in an area with a curved roof and you go underneath the roof and you talk and it feels like your voice is amplified and echoey and you walk to other areas and it sounds completely different. Those are all examples of the same idea that the sound waves in this case are bouncing around and converging at certain spots. So let's put this into a geologic context. Let's put this into a geologic context. Here's an example of Mexico City. Mexico City is built in the bed of an old lake. And that bed of the old lake, it formed in a, this is created actually by, these are faults, these are normal faults, these all came down here. And it created a depression, this is all hard igneous rock underneath. Hard igneous rock, faults here that created an ancient depression, two of them actually. Old lakes used to form in here. And those lakes let, uh, left behind thick layers of sediment. So obviously slightly thicker in here, that would be the area that otherwise would be deadliest. Okay? But also, it resulted in this geologic structure here, the same geologic structure, this dish-shaped structure that created a spot for water to pool that formed this ancient lake. It now causes waves which are traveling through this sediment to bounce around, bounce, 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 bounce. They're bouncing around. They're going to bounce back together when they hit each one of these sides. And just like a satellite dish, they're going to get focused right in the center. And guess where Mexico City is built? Right in the center of that. So here's a diagram of actual damage. These seismic waves, they're going to come, let's say they even, they're not from in here. That's not the epicenter. It's over here somewhere. The seismic waves are going to come in and they're going to go bounce, 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 bounce. They're bouncing around and they are converging on average in that center right there. Right? So this is just an unfortunate coincidence between the underlying structural geology, this dome shape, right? this dome shape or dish shaped, not dome, dish shaped, hard underlying geology, and the waves enter it. Once they enter, they bounce around, they get kind of stuck in here. And that causes amplified damage right in the middle. And this has really happened. Mexico City, there was a major earthquake uh, in the 1980s. The actual epicenter was 350 kilometers away, which should not have caused really any damage at all, right, by that distance. It was a pretty big earthquake, but nowhere near big enough to cause this kind of damage. But three things converged. The first is that... Uh, is that this was on soft sediment. The second is that the underlying structural geology caused those waves to bounce around and accumulate in one particular area. And the third thing was that the particular wavelength of the waves that were arriving, because remember you have all these different kinds of waves, the particular wavelengths of the waves that were arriving interacted with the tallest buildings in Mexico City and caused them to fall down. So that third one is a new idea. We're going to talk about that. So this is this idea of resonance. This idea of resonance. So you have different kinds of sound waves. This is sound. But remember, we have different kinds of seismic waves as well. And they have different wavelengths, right? These surface waves have really long wavelengths. And so they lose energy a lot slower than these short wavelength PNS waves, right? These are the things you're going to get your first, but they attenuate faster than these guys. So by the time the waves had gone 350 kilometers and gotten all the way to Mexico City, it was just these long rolling surface waves that got there. And they retained a fair amount of their energy, actually. Now, when they got there, though, they interacted with the buildings of different sizes. So that these tall buildings have a natural tendency right, to vibrate at these, at these short wavelength or long wavelength uh, uh, waves at these low frequencies right here, right? these low frequencies right here. So they are vulnerable at a greater distance as a result. I'm gonna show you how that makes sense in uh, this diagram right here. This is another guy here. Uh, this is a really neat, this is actually the same guy who made the last one. Um, this is a really neat diagram. So uh, watch the video. Of the different building models, this is my favorite. This model uses a uh, block of wood. In this case, they've got wheels on it to make it easier to move back and forth to simulate earthquake vibrations. And these are dowel sticks of different lengths with blocks of wood on top. So we've got tall building representation down to short building. And I, I like if there's a group of people, a group of kids, 
to ask them, uh, which building do you think would move around the most in the earthquake? Which will move the most in the earthquake? And very often they will pick the tall building because this obviously is, is it's moving around, it seems a lot like even by itself right now. But so then I generate the earthquake by vibrating the ground. Oh my goodness. The tall, the short building has moved the most. So, okay, well, now you know what the answer is. You get one more guess. So now a lot of people change their guess and say, well, I think maybe the short one will move the most. So now I make another earthquake. Say, well, here's another earthquake. Oh, lo and behold, it's a tall one now that's vibrating the most. So at this point, I think it's good to have a question and issues. For kids to, to think about for a second, okay, now what's going on? There must be some trick to this. What is he doing differently between the short building moving the most and the tall building moving the most? And so then I explain that, well, it actually has to do with the resonant frequency of each of these buildings, which is quite different. The resonant frequency is the frequency that the building wants to move back and forth if you just give it a bump. And you can see the short building moves back and forth very quickly when you just pull it and let it go. The tall building moves very slowly and these move with intermediate frequencies. So if the ground motion is the same as the resonant period, <coughs> resonant frequency of one of these buildings, the amplitude of the building motion will build larger and larger. So if I move the ground very rapidly back and forth, I'm giving a resonant, resonant frequency near this one. You can see the amplitude there, it's very large. And if I go very slowly, All of them lose most. And you can also go to intermediate frequencies. For this one, I can't the move. So let's go back to the example of uh, Mexico City. Remember that the epicenter, right, the focus of this, uh, or the epicenter, I'm going to refer to epicenter, remember we're really talking about the focus, is really where this thing started, it was a long ways away. And so as a result, the high frequency waves that would be interacting with the low frequency waves, right, they mostly attenuated away. And so what you got, what you got arriving was preferentially low frequency waves. And those low frequency waves you saw in the last diagram are going to interact with the natural resonance of these really large buildings. And so a combination of the distance leading to a selectivity kind of of the, of the, of the frequency of the waves arriving, combined with the fact that it was hitting a large city. If this had been a village, it actually ironically would have been less affected. Right? It was a fact this was a place with lots of tall buildings which were very, which are very profoundly affected by these low frequency waves that arrived. The sediment, which is going to amplify it as well, as well as this dish-shaped structure, which is going to amplify it by focusing it all together. All of those things combined together to make this profoundly devastating uh, earthquake. Now combine that with the fact that in the 1980s in particular, the building codes were not the best in Mexico. So a lot of the buildings that fell down, I mean, they were first, they were first predictably in the 10 to 20 story range. That's the range where the frequency, the resonance, rather, interacted with the frequency of the waves that were coming in. But also, uh, there is obviously a building construction, a building code kind of aspect of this as well. So if you go into the PowerPoint, you can check on these links, and there's a, a bunch of extra information here about the, uh, the Mexico City earthquake. All right, let's quickly talk about man-made earthquakes. So earthquakes we've looked at at this point, all the result of movement along faults. So we naturally build up energy along the faults as a result of uh, as a result of tectonic motion. That material builds up, that strain builds up in the form of elastic deformation. It releases itself either by overcoming friction and sliding, or by causing brittle failure, right, where there's actually a physical breakage creating new faults. Now we can also create earthquakes, and in some of these cases we're actually creating the seismic energy ourselves. But in most of these cases, what we're doing is facilitating it. So it's not really man-made earthquakes, it's man-triggered earthquakes in that case. So let's run through these. So you may have seen stories like this, right? fracking. Uh, we're not really going to talk about fracking in this class. Come and talk to me if you want, if you want to talk about fracking more. It's complicated. But if you want to talk about fracking or hydraulic fracturing, 
Right? That is the, uh, it's a method of extracting oil and gas where fluids and their mixes of gases and, uh, and primarily water, but sometimes gases and that as well, butane, things like that, are pumped down under extreme pressure to cause the underlying rocks to physically crack, right? creating little fractures that oil and gas trapped within those rocks can flow out through. So that's if hydraulic fracturing. So the actual act of fracturing causes the rocks to break and by itself causes very small earthquakes, but so small that you cannot actually feel it. There is a much larger problem though caused by hydraulic fracturing, but it's not specific to hydraulic fracturing. It's actually specific to any pumping of water into a reservoir. And I'll show you exactly in a second what that is, but I just want you to notice these headlines and I want to reiterate that these are real. This is actually a real thing, right? Fracking really does, or really can, rather really can, cause at least medium-sized earthquakes. This is something else you might have seen in the news. Seismic waves in North Korea suggest a repeat of 2013 nuclear test. This is from 2016. And so the claim was, North Korea has claimed that they had made a major advance in terms of their uh, weapons technology, that the bomb they had detonated was way bigger. So going way back to uh, just after the Second World War, the uh, Americans in particular set up actually an array of seismic uh, detectors specifically to be able to watch the Russians. They were principally interested, but really anybody who was conducting, uh, conducting uh, nuclear tests. Because the amount of energy released by an atomic bomb is equivalent to a earthquake of a given magnitude. And so you can use exactly the same, everything we've been doing right now, to track down where somebody is doing testing, in particular underground testing, which is where a lot of the tests were done. You can figure out not only where they're doing it, but how big, right, what the magnitude of that original energy release is. So in fact, a lot of the seismological data we actually have, and a lot of the basic earthquake science, again, uh, as with many things, came out of weapons technology. Right? Not in this case directly designing weapons, but rather trying to figure out what other people were designing. The Americans uh, invested really heavily in a global seismic network to look at uh, violations of test bans and to look at what kinds of technologies are being used. And so we can use this now. And so when the Americans wanted to know, look, is it true? You know, the CIA would have turned to the or the NSA or whoever would have turned at uh, this point to the seismologists and said, look, we've got a claim that the North Koreans, they said they've made this major advance and the nuke they set off was way bigger, was it? And in this case, the seismologist looked at the energy that was released and said, nah, -uh. uh there is no apparent, uh, it, it, is, it is apparent they did not do this. And in the past, they did the same thing. The North Koreans would make claims that they set off a weapon of, you know, X magnitude and the seismologist would say that's impossible. Given the amount of energy released, there's no way they've done this. So uh, just an interesting both connection between the history of kind of Cold War politics and, uh, and the history of seismology, but also today, just remember that this network can be used to pick up any release of seismic energy, whether it's an atomic blast or whether it's movement along a fault. All right, so here's another one. I'm going to unpack this in a second. This is a headline from uh, 2008. The headlines are actually from 2008. The headline was from later on, papers that came out afterwards. But there's a major devastating earthquake that took place in 2008. And the, the suggestion here was there was a linkage between that and a massive hydroelectric dam. And I'll unpack that in a second. So here is the, the, big, the big kind of categories of things. So earthquakes can be triggered by what? By detonating nuclear bombs. And that can either be the source of the seismic energy itself, or it can add additional stress to a fault which is already under stress and cause that fault to go off. So there is a risk, for example, that if you were detonating atomic bombs, uh, or if you tried to in a weird, you know, James Bond uh, plot scenario, you know, you buried atomic bombs, deep around the uh, San Andreas Fault, you really could generate, uh, by releasing that built-up, pent-up seismic energy along the San Andreas Fault, you really could um, generate a massive, or not generate, but trigger a massive earthquake right, with very little additional energy input if you put it in the right spot. So any of you guys decide you want to be James Bond villains and you want to extract $1 trillion from the, uh, the federal government and the states, nuclear weapons all along the San Andreas Fault. Find a seismologist and a nuclear physicist and you guys can form a triad of evil. Uh, do not really do that. Just to be clear, Geology 1107 at Cape Breton University, do not, do not endorse, right? in no way endorse forming triads of evil of any kind. All right, 
Number two is injecting fluid. So this is the same basic idea. You're just going to be adding pressure into a system that is already under stress. So you're not actually, it's not about the energy coming from the, the fluid itself. It's about tipping one of those uh, faults, which is already just about to go over. So think about poking your finger in a mouse trap. Right? It's not the actual energy from the finger poke, which is going to hurt. It's the energy of releasing all of that pent up energy in the mouse trap that's going to hurt. So this is something that can happen in any kind of either wastewater disposal or in hydraulic fraction. Anytime we pump deep water into a basin. And then adding dams. And what's going on here is that you're simply going to be adding weight. And if you add weight, you're putting more stress potentially on a system which is already under stress and potentially triggering again uh, faults that were already spring loaded and ready to go. You're pushing them over the edge. So it's the finger in the mouse trap again. Really only this one here are we actually is, is the actual source of the energy potentially man-made. And every other one of these examples, we are just inducing activity in a system which is all ready to go. So we all refer to all of these as induced seismicity. So something human beings have done that has caused an earthquake. So uh, if you click on these links in the PowerPoint, again, it'll take you through information on this. So the North Korean nuclear program studied by seismologists. That, by the way, is an actual seismogram of, uh, one, of the, one of the tests here. These are actually, actually, that's four of the tests superimposed together. And what you should see is that, uh, you know, these, they are of similar magnitude, of similar magnitude. 2000, uh, the, the red and the yellow ones are slightly larger than the original ones. But in particular, the yellow and the red seem to be of a similar magnitude. So it doesn't seem like there's been a massive, you know, massive shift in terms of weapons technology or capacity on the part of the, of the North Koreans by that point. Now, here's another example, actually, of directly induced seismicity or triggered, not just triggered, but actually the created seismicity. So this is something that was pioneered by the British, um, but it's been used in uh, other times as well. You hear about these mother of all bomb kind of things. These are massive, uh, massive uh, detonations that are used to actually destroy bunkers. So bunkers are protected from the explosion themselves, but these are bombs which are designed to create seismic waves. And the seismic waves then, remember, travel through the earth and can cause damage to the structure down below. So these so-called earthquake bombs were pioneered by the British. I mean, this is, look at the size of this, right? This is a massive ordinance. And you can, again, click on the link in the PowerPoint and read more on these. So here's an example of pumping water in where you add, you change the pressure and also potentially lubricate that. Because remember, this is frictionally resisting. You can also potentially kind of push that apart, put pressure within that system or lubricate it. But just putting any kind of additional stress in here, any actual pressure on here can cause that pent up energy to be released. You can cause much smaller things by extracting that because that's going to cause the ground to potentially settle, which again will cause potential cracking along the surface. And this final one up here, this is a dam example where we literally just put weight on top, which is then going to put pressure on this underlying fault, which can cause that fault, which already has pent up energy to move. So here are your diagrams. You can click on those links right there. Um, and in particular with fracking, you get these little earthquakes most of the time. There's been some kind of medium-sized ones, but generally speaking, at least in the British Columbia, there have not been big ones. Now, there are some worrying examples of ones that have occurred and could potentially occur in areas where you have faults that are already capable of generating large earthquakes. Because remember, these things are going to be triggering large earthquakes. They're not, they're not causing it. They're not the source of the energy. They're tipping over right? a, a domino that's already on the edge of going over. They're just pushing it over. So here's, a, this is a study that came out, I forget, I think this is 2016, maybe this study. This is a map here of earthquakes in America over a 35 year period. And what I want you to notice are these clusters right here, these clusters. These clusters with the definition around here, these show areas that where there has been a lot of hydraulic fracturing going on. And in some of these areas, you have seen a dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes relative to historical data. So, for example, in some of these central areas here, they went from you know, they went from three right, three earthquakes uh, a year on average. In uh, uh, sorry, this is of a magnitude of three. Sorry, uh, they went up to a thousand earthquakes a year from only an average of twenty four before. So you're talking about a, a magnitude of a forty fold impact uh, in terms of. Uh, in terms of increase, almost 40 times the increase in terms of magnitude three in some of these areas. 
So obviously this is some, this is worry. Now a magnitude three is is really just an inconvenience. You're barely going to feel that. Remember that that's where like at a party if you had music playing you're not going to feel this thing. It's a truck driving by kind of. It's a slight rumble. But greater than, by the time you get up to three, you start to get into the zone where you could potentially do something. By the time you get up to kind of five, a five is a noticeable earthquake, but not really damage. But it's going to stop you and scare you. By the time you jump into a six, you're causing potential damage. So none of these guys yet are really big earthquakes. But we've had historically in this area really large earthquakes. And I'll unpack that idea uh, actually in class. So here is this final one. This is a massive earthquake. It killed 90,000 people. It was a 7.9. This is a large-scale earthquake in northern China and Sichuan, uh, 2008. Coincidentally, there is the epicenter of the earthquake. Coincidentally, there was a massive dam which was built just upstream from where this earthquake uh, initiated, from the epicenter of the earthquake, just upstream. Now, the dam, the reservoir of the dam, the dam itself is not the problem. It's all the water behind the dam. There's 315 million tons of water. and All of that pressure is pushing down on a system which is seismically active. So if you built this in an area where there is no seismicity, you built this in Saskatchewan, no problem at all. If you build this, on the other hand, in an area where you already have faults that exist and faults that are under pressure, that additional pressure can trigger faults. It can load faults and cause them to fail. So you really have to understand the underlying geology before you do any of this stuff. Construct hydroelectric dams, construct, uh, engage in hydraulic fracturing, any of this kind of stuff. You need to know the underlying geology. And so this is why it's so important to get basic, basic regional geology done and structural geology done as a part of any kind of engineering uh, project. So there's the spot. This is the Three Gorges Dam. This is the largest dam in the entire world. This thing is massive. It's something like three kilometers across. This is huge. If any of you go to China, it's worth going and seeing it. This is one of the, you know, the greatest pieces of engineering that humanity has ever created. There's lots of problems associated with it, both in terms of you know, sediment buildup in here, as well as the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people along the course of this reservoir. Uh, but in terms of a seismic hazard thing, there has been at least 3,000 small earthquakes so far linked to this. And there has been no large earthquakes yet, but there could potentially be one. This is over this interval here. So, so far, nothing catastrophic associated with this, but that relationship you'd expect when you add pressure to a system certainly exists. Here's another one you read about sometimes. This is an actual paper, came out in 2016. So this is not induced seismicity but by human beings, but can the moon induce seismicity? Well, that sounds crazy, except when you think about the moon's gravitational pull is literally pulling water slightly up, which is why you get tides. And that same amount of pressure, that same amount of stress that the, uh, that the gravity is exerting on water, it's also exerting on all of the solids around. You just can't see them to form because, well, they're way harder to form. But could it be that that little extra pull, especially during cycles of the moon when it's really close, could it be that that little bit of extra pull is enough to trigger a fault which would otherwise maybe not go to go. So could you see a correlation in time between when earthquakes occur and the timings of moon cycles? The answer to that is apparently no. Uh, this is a paper you can read. This is I actually just saw this speaker at, a, uh, <laughs> at the conference I was just at. This talked to me about this it really irritates me. This is the abstract, which normally in a scientific paper is a short version of everything afterwards. And her abstract, she did it as a joke. Right? The abstract is literally just the word no. Do large, greater than eight magnitude global earthquakes occur on preferred days of the calendar year or the lunar cycle? And the answer is no. Uh, talk to me about it, but my main problem with this is just that there's no information here. So if you want to figure out their methodology or anything else, you can't. And because most scientific papers are actually held within, they're held by private uh, organizations. So you know this this journal is a private is a private journal you have to pay to access that and so to read the actual paper costs you like 30 bucks unless you are, happen to belong to a university where the university library pays it for you and so if you want to read their methodology you can't do it so this was this was a, a purposely trying to actually deal with they're being snarky in purpose but they were doing it to try to get generate media attention which they did it was in all the news right it was in all the news because these things have been in the news and they were worried people were scared and they thought there was no their their data their statistical data shows there's no reason to be concerned really big earthquakes seem not to correlate with the lunar cycle do little ones maybe we don't know right there just isn't any data there all right so 
I'm going to end right here. I'm going to put the uh, the um, quiz up online in class on Tuesday. We're going to go through the effects, and I'm going to give you a chance to ask any questions you've had from these two lectures. So hopefully this has worked. Hopefully the quality has been okay. Uh, if you guys like this, we could potentially do some more of these in the future where we could put the emphasis on class and you're doing activities. They call it a flipped classroom model where we could do a lecture at home, right? review questions, uh, group activities during the day. I'm open to that. So let me know. Give me feedback. Did it work? Did it not? If you don't feel comfortable talking to me in person, slide a thing under my door. Write it, in the, uh, write it in the course evaluations. If this is something I should be doing more of, let me know. All right. Hopefully you enjoyed that.